in the name in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. First, I like to wish you all a very blessed and happy Hosanna Sunday, and also I wish all of you to have a very blessed uh, Holy Week and Feast of Resurrection. Tonight, our Bible study, Psalm 47. It's a short Psalm, nine verses, so we will not take a lot of time. Each Psalm, as I told before, has uh, a title. And unfortunately, these titles are not written in Coptic leader. But if you look at any book, you will find these titles. The title of Psalm 47 says, To the chief musician, a psalm of the son of Korah. And according to the Septuagint version, it is written to completion, a psalm of the son of Korah. To completion means to the end of the days. Chief musician, some believe it is the Lord Jesus Christ himself, and others suppose him to be a leader of choir, of musician, in David's time, like he meant the singer or a set. Sons of Korah, who is Korah? Korah was a descendant of Levi as we read in Leviticus chapter 6, verse 16 to 24. Therefore, sons of Korah are Levites. Most assume that these sons of Korah addressed here are the Leviticus singers in the temple. And so they were performers of the song not the authors of the psalm. They chanted the psalm, but they did not compose the psalm. The occasion of this psalm, probably that, like 46 and 48, because these three psalms celebrate victorious, uh, the victorious Lord, the victory of the Lord who defeated his enemies. So, 46, 47, 48, celebration of a recent victory, after which God, who had come down to fight for his people, as if God came down to fight to his people, now he ascended up in triumph to heaven, which happened in the incarnation of our Lord Jesus Christ. So he descended down to save us, and he destroyed the devil, and then he ascended to heaven in glory. So this psalm actually has a prophetic and messianic meaning. Also, some say this psalm is composed on the occasion of carrying up the ark from the house of Obedidom to Mount Zion. But it is, as I told you, a messianic psalm. It is a prophecy about the ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ and his sitting upon the, his throne of glory at the right hand of God the Father, celebrating his reign over the whole earth. Before the incarnation of the Son of God, kingdom was the ruler of this world. But the Lord Jesus Christ came to establish the kingdom of God and he reigned. That's why we say, our Lord, God, Savior, and King of us all. He is now our King. And the millennium started on the day of crucifixion. But as our brothers, the Protestants, say, God will come and reign a thousand years on earth. No, the millennium started already on the day of crucifixion. Also, it is a prophecy of the gospel to the whole world and the defeats it made in the Gentile world 
defeating the idols, defeating the worship of the idols. And after the Christ's ascension, the apostles went to the whole world and preached the gospel. And according to the Talmud, this psalm in the latter Jewish eras was used in celebrating the new year, the new Jewish year, and on the day of the feast of the blowing of the trumpets, the feast of the trumpets. In a spiritual sense, it appears to relate to the calling of the Gentiles. You know, God came among the Jews and the Jews did not accept him. Then after his ascension, the apostle started serving among the Jews. Then they start to spread to the Gentiles. Gentiles, by the way, means the non-Jewish people, like us, the Egyptians, who are Gentiles. So in a spiritual sense, it relates to the calling of the Gentiles to be made partakers of the blessing of the gospel with the converted Jews. Also, this psalm is one of the third hour of the Agbaya Psalms. Actually, it is the last psalm in the third hour of the Agbaya. And I'm sure you notice after we finish the Kabon, after he finished the Divine Liturgy, he circles the altar one time and he kisses each corner of the altar and clap his hand at each uh, corner. So the priest prays this psalm. So while Abuna is going around the altar and kissing the altar and claps his hand, the four corners, he recites this psalm, Psalm 47, at the end of the, of the liturgy. Because at the end of the liturgy, after we finish, as, uh, yeah, we have Christ, Emmanuel, our God, with us on the table. Then after we finish communion, God ascends. So we celebrate this ascension. Uh, at the end of the liturgy, he encircled the altar once, clapping and kissing the altar, praising and glorifying God. As I told you, it is just nine verses. Verse 1 and 2, a call to praise God. Verses 3 and 4, God's special care for his people. Verse 5 to 7, a repeated command to praise God for his sovereignty. 8 and 9, the worship of the princes of the nation. Princes of the nations worship God. So let's start from verse 1. Oh, clap your hands. All you people, shout to God with voices of triumph. The psalmist invites all the nations, all the people, to exhibit the gladness of their heart by their language and by their gesture. So not only by their language, but also by their gesture. All you people, not only the Jews, or oh, clap your hands, all you people. So it includes the Jews and the Gentiles, all nations. For the church, which is Christ's body, is spread over all the world. So the church is composed from the converted Jews and also from the Gentiles. San Marco preached Egypt, who was a Jewish man. They all urged to acknowledge and greet God as a new king was saluted with clapping of hands and also with shouting. Clapping is a common way of expressing joy and it is usually an outward expression of inward joy. Not only clapping but shout, shout to God with voice, with the voice of triumph. In Numbers 23, verse 21, the shout of a king means what? Means the shout, the, the shout with which Israel 
celebrates the presence of God in its midst as a victorious king. So from his invitation to clap hands, we are not to conclude that we are called upon to do this in a literal sense of expression, but we are called upon to be an internally glad and joyful as those who give expression to their joy by clapping their hands on such gesture. So we are not called to do it literally, more importantly, to do it spiritually when we come to worship God in a spirit of joy and gladness. St. Augustine says, what is all clap? Means rejoice. But wherefore with, my ha with the hands? Rejoice with hands. He said means rejoice with good works. So not literally with hands, but when we do good works, we are clapping, we are rejoicing. Do not rejoice with the mouth while idle with the hands. Do not rejoice with the mouth while idle with hands, St. Augustine. Then verse two, give us a reason why we need to clap, why we shout to God with the voice of joy. He said, for the Lord Most High is awesome. He is a great king over all the earth. He is awesome and he is a great king over all the earth. So in verse 2, gives us a reason for having invited all nations to rejoice and exalt. This can be applied only to the kingdom of Christ, a high and awesome kingdom which cannot be shaken. The Lord Most High he is exalted above all other beings. He is not merely king of Israel, but after he died on the cross, now he became king of all the earth. He established the kingdom of God. He is to be feared. The Lord of hosts, him you shall hallow, let him be your fear. Isaiah 8, 13. Why? He is to be feared on account of his goodness as the redeemer and savior of his people. They shall fear the Lord and his goodness. Verse 3, feared because the, in Arabic, he is awesome to be feared. Verse 3, he will subdue the peoples under us and the nations under our feet. So the question here, who are the people that will be subdued? And who are us? And who are the nations that will be subdued under our feet? The word here, he will, he will. So the word here is in the future tense. It points the people here, he will subdue the people, points to the Gentiles who are to be called into God's church and to receive the blessing of grace and bring them to the knowledge and worship God under the subjection to the gospel. So the Gentiles will subdue, but subdued to whom? St. Augustine answered this question. Who are us? Which subdued and to whom? Who are they that speak? Definitely not the Jews. Surely if apostles, 
So the apostles here, the ambassadors of Christ are speaking. Surely if saints, here refers to the apostle and the saints according to St. Augustine. For under this, God has subdued the people and the nations. And today they are honored among the nations who by their own citizens earned to be slain. By their own citizens means by the Jews they were slain. And their Lord Jesus Christ was slain by his citizens, by the Jews, and is honored among the nations, among the Gentiles, was crucified by his own, by the Jews, but he is adored by aliens, the Gentiles, by those, by a price made his own. He purchased us by the price his own blood. So here in a prophetic way, that's why it starts he well, he will. He will subdue the Gentiles to the apostles. They will submit to the apostles, not in their persons, but as a representative of God, as ambassadors of Christ. So it is receiving the word of the apostle to enter into the meek flock of Christ when the Gentiles forsake their spirit of pride and haughtiness and their oppression against the church and they bow and carry the cross of Christ with joy and gladness. The Gentiles at the beginning were prideful, were haughty, and they oppressed the, the Christian. But after they heard the word of the apostles, they become among the meek flock of Christ, among the gentle flock of Christ. Now they bow and they carry the cross of Christ with joy and gladness. But according to other fathers, that's what St. Augustine said. He will subdue the people under us or, or to us, it means the people here, submission of the demons and sins that have for long subdued the heathen nation and they're falling under feet of the cross. So here the people and the nations can be the demons, not because the people are demons, but because they were in the kingdom of Satan. So these demons who subdued the Gentiles for a very long time, 5,500 years before Christ, now these demons and sins are subdued to us, the children of God, and Satan is crushed under the feet of the cross and under our feet, the Christian and the demon. For by the submission of the Gentiles in faith, with the spirit of love and obedience, their evil, the devil, is crushed under the feet of the church. As we will chant during this holy week, crush the Satan under our feet. Saint Cyril of Alexandria, on the same verse, he says, we see the saints through the voice of the psalmist raised up, presenting praises of thanksgiving to Christ who crowns them, saying, so Saint Cyril agrees with Saint Augustine, who is speaking here the saints. He subdues the people under us and the nations under our feet. The ultimate desire of the saints is to see those they instruct become partakers of the grace given to them by Christ. So what is the goal of the apostles? That the people will be partaker of the grace. And this grace was given from Christ to the apostles to actually give it to the people. According to the epistle sent by the apostle Paul to the Romans saying, for I long to see you 
that I may impart to you some spiritual gift so that you may be established. Verse 4. He will choose our inheritance for us. The excellence of Jacob, whom he loves, Selah. He would choose our inheritance for us, the inheritance intended for us, designed to be ours. But what is the inheritance of a Christian, of a true believer? Is God Himself, who is the portion of His people. Or even, Maybe he means the portion or the inheritance in this life. God knows what is best for his people. Therefore, we should leave it to him who can make a better choice for us than ourselves. We ought to submit our will, our choice, our desire to him and let him choose our inheritance. Our heritage here on earth and hereafter in heaven, we ought to leave it to him. Let him do with us as he seems good and according to his word. He will choose our inheritance for us, the excellence of Jacob. Means God is the excellence of Jacob, whom he loves. Selah. So, he mean here the person of Jacob, Jacob as a person, who though never had the actual possession of Canaan, the promised land, yet had the Lord himself and his presence and blessing of his inheritance. So, God was the excellence of Jacob. Or either he means Jacob not as a person, but as a father of Israel. So he refers to Israel. And many times the Israel as a nation, we call it Jacob. For these did actually enjoy, the Israelites enjoy both the promised inheritance of Canaan and also the presence of God in his temple among them, in their midst. But verse 4 reads differently in the Septuagint. And actually, when you use the Agbeya, because the Agbeya is taken from the Septuagint, it reads different than here. Here we read, He, God, will choose our inheritance for us. In the Septuagint, it says, uh, he will choose us as his inheritance. He will choose us as his inheritance, not he choose inheritance for us. So, if we rejoice because God, by his cross, has drawn the Gentiles to be members of his holy church in submission to the apostles. So the secret of our joy is truly the work of God who planned the ordinance, the economy of salvation and gave us himself as our portion. So God became our inheritance. And in the same way, he received us as his portion and inheritance. So here, God became our inheritance and we became his inheritance. Sila, to pause and to reflect and to meditate. So when you read the word Sila, Sila means pause. Just it's a time to reflect how God chose us as his inheritance. And in the same way, he became our inheritance. This needs reflection from us. Verse 5. God has gone up a sin with a shout, the Lord with the sound of a trumpet. So in verse one, 
the psalmist invited all nations to express gladness of their heart by saying, clap your hands, all you people, shout to God with the voice of triumph. And from verse 2, he gave us reasons why we should rejoice, why we should clap our hands and shout. Now he presents a fourth reason for joy and gladness. He mentioned three reasons before. The first reason, because God is awesome, he is a great king over all the earth. The second reason, because he will subdue people under us and the nations under our feet. The third reason, he will choose our inheritance for us, the excellence of Jacob, whom he loved. In verse 5, give us fifth reason. The fourth, uh, sorry, the fourth reason. Uh, what is the fourth reason for joy and gladness? After the Lord chose his inheritance, selected his apostles and disciples, he ascended into heaven. And why we should shout? You will hear, and I want you to pay attention, when I'm going to praise the fraction of Bright Saturday, the fraction of, of Bright Saturday, Abuna will say in this fraction that Jesus entered into the most high places, the place which no one with human in nature should enter. Why this is very important? Because the high place is the, the highest of the, the heaven of heavens. No one with human nature should enter. But now the Lord Jesus Christ ascended by his body, ascended with the humanity, with the human nature. Can anyone stop the Lord Jesus Christ from entering the heaven of heavens? No one, because he is God. Since he entered with our humanity, then those who are in him can enter the same place. So he gave us access to the highest places in heaven because he entered there. So although no one with human nature should enter this place, but if we are in Christ, then through Christ we can enter this place. That's why his ascension, he raised our nature that is united to his own above all heavens, above all angels, above all created beings. St. Paul in Ephesians said, he seated us with him in the heavenly places. So we rejoice and we clap our hands because of this. Now we have access to the highest heaven. God has gone up. Gone up means previously he came down. That's the incarnation. So the Son of God, who is truly God, equal to the Father, the Lord that was made flesh and dwelt among men on earth, incarnation. He is said to go up when he finished his work for us on the cross and proved, proved it by the empty tomb, which is indication of his resurrection. He can only go up with a shout because he came down in humility to fight for his people and to save them. St. John Chrysostom says, he did not say he has been taken up, but has gone up. What is the difference? Been taken up means somebody took him up, like Elijah, for example. But Jesus has gone up showing that he did not go up with anyone else to guide him, but he made his way to the highest heaven by himself. St. John Chrysostom also says that with a shout carries a spiritual meaning and refers to Christ's victory 
because the ascension of Christ before the disciples occurred in silence. We didn't read in the Gospel of Luke or in the book of Acts, there was shout. So shout here is not literally, but spiritually or symbolically, it refers to Christ's victory. St. John Chrysostom says, he went up with victory, having conquered the death, overthrown sin, subdued the demons, expelled error, changed everything for the better, leading our nature to its ancestral country, or rather, to a much better one. The shout of the trumpet. Why trumpet? Because trumpet make the strongest and clearest sound. It's a sound of victory. But as I told you, there is nothing in the New Testament concerning the apostles hearing the sound of a trumpet. Yet we observe that the apostles saw the Lord Jesus Christ as the victorious and conqueror king who set forth to heaven. But it was heaven that gave the sound of the trumpets, proclaiming the conquest of her king. So on earth here, the apostles did not hear any trumpet, but the heaven gave the sound of the trumpet. But on the day of his second coming, the angel will sound the trumpet. Verse 6, Sing praises to God. Sing praises. Sing praises to our King. Sing praises four times. Sing praises before God. Now the psalmist, before giving us the fifth reason why we should praise God, he actually excites all to shout in repeated expression of admiration and God ascended gloriously. Sing praises for us is like a command. Yes, it is a fitting command in the light of the glory of the kings of all earth. This word sing praises repeated four times in this short verse to show the genuineness, genuineness and sincerity and joy of the people. They are words of victory, sing praises and celebration and show that the heart was full or was overflowing with joy. It also showed how the psalmist was fervently desirous that God must have his new praise. God should have his new praise and glory and how important of great necessity it was to men to praise him. The repetition four times may also mean that the psalmist called the nation at the four corners of the world, east, west, north, and south, to be only preoccupied with singing praises to him. So the ascension of Christ is of great importance, as I explained to you and requires to be performed in such a manner. The psalmist first said, sing praises for he is our God. Sing, sing praises to God. So sing praises because he is our God. Second, sing praises for he is our King. Thirdly, sing praises to him because he is the King of all the earth. Then he asked that the praise should be done with understanding. He says to do so not only repeatedly, but wisely, with attention, making no mistakes to their end. For any duty made to a great, great king must be practiced in such manner. Again, any duty made to a great king must be practiced in such manner. So when we praise God, we should praise him in a way that's befitting his glory. Now he is moving to the 
verse 7, as I told you, he gave us four, four reasons. Number one, sing praises to God, in verse 6. So sing praises because he's our God. Number two, sing praises to our king because he's our king. Number three, for God is the king of all the earth. That's the third reason. Sing praises with understanding. So not just you utter words, but you should utter it with understanding. Sing praises because he's our God, he's our king, he's the king of all earth, and sing praises understand. Now in verse 8, he will give us the fifth reason. God reigns over the nations. God sits on his holy throne. So a fifth reason for singing and chanting to God with the voice of joy, drive it from Christ after his ascension to heaven, having sent his apostle to preach the gospel and to gather the Gentiles to his fold. So God reigns over the nations. That's a fifth reason. Why you should sing praises? But now God reigns over the nations. First, he started, he reigned over Israel under the former economy in the Old Testament. But now, in the new covenant, he reigns over the Gentiles under the gospel economy. And then he said, God sits on his holy on his holy throne because the throne of God is the righteous for the sake of whose purity God dwells in them according to Father Consumus, Bishop of Jerusalem so when John had his heavenly experience as he recorded in the book of Revelation chapter 4 and 5 he described everything in heaven in relation to this the throne on which God the Father was seated. It is his throne. His throne means belong to him and none other. Jesus, the Son of God, having done his work on earth, he is received up into heaven and is seated on his throne at the right hand of the Father. St. John Chrysostom says, what is the meaning of sits on his holy throne? Means he reigns, he rules. Holy was well put his holy throne. In fact, he not only reigns, but reigns in a holy manner. Many kings reign, but Christ reigns in a holy manner. So in the spirit of prophecy, the psalmist sees the fulfillment of the hope expressed in verse 1. When he said, clap your hand, all your people. The nations acknowledge God's sovereignty and authority. The nations are not called the people of God in the Old Testament, but now we are the people of God. So this title in the Old Testament was reserved for Israel. The only in the New Testament, and only in the New Testament, promises made to Israel extended to the Gentiles. So now we are the people of God. The psalmist may have been explaining this sentence, God reigns over the nations, the preaching of the apostle would bring the princes of the people to the truth. That is the last verse, verse 9. So the psalmist tried to explain what does it mean God reigns over the nations. So in verse 9, which is the last verse, he said, the princes of the people have gathered together. The people of God, the people of the God of Abraham, for the shields of the earth belong to God. He is greatly exalted. So the psalmist tried to explain in verse 8, God reigns over the nations. So he's saying by the preaching of the apostles, the princes of the people came to the true faith. The apostles preaching would oblige them 
to abandon the worship of idols and turn to the God of Abraham, who is the only and true God. Thus, he may be their God, and the nations will be his people, the people of God. So in the new covenant, not only Israel, but the Gentiles are the people of God. The princes, the great men among the Gentiles, who had been slaves of sin, worshippers of idols, now by their conversion became children of God, heirs of the kingdom of heaven. The princes of the earth, the princes of the people have gathered together to worship God. The people of God, now they are the people of God of Abraham. So we are children of Abraham by faith, not by race, but by faith. For the shields of the earth belong to God, he is greatly exalted. The, so they become heirs of the kingdom of heaven. The people of God, the people of the God of Abraham, the covenant promise shall be fulfilled. When God said to Abraham, in your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Let me mention something quickly here. In the three chapter, chapter eight, nine and 10, in the book of Acts, we have three conversion. In eight, we have the conversion of the Ethiopian eunuch. Nine, the conversion of St. Paul. 10, the conversion of Cornelius. The Ethiopian eunuch is a descendant of Ham, because Ham is the father of Cush. Cush is Ethiopia, the land of Cush. St. Paul is a descendant of Shem, he was a Hebrew. And Cornelius, a Gentile, is a descendant of Japheth. And these are the three are the tribes of the earth, because after the flood, all of us came either from Ham or Shem or Japheth. So very early in the book of Acts, that's why these three, these three conversions are recorded. To say that in the seed of Abraham, in Jesus Christ, all the tribes of the earth were blessed. And in your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Of the God of Abraham are the Gentiles receiving the gospel, who may, who, who Partakers of the faith of Abraham and his spiritual children, children of Abraham by faith. St. John Christum says, the psalmist said that God of Abraham, to show him to be the one God of the new and old testament. So, why, so John Christum says, why he said God of Abraham? Because the God of the old testament is the same God of the New Testament, in whom the Gentiles believe. What does it mean, the last verse, the shields of the earth belong to God? He is greatly exalted. Means shields, shields those who protect the people. Who protect the people? Usually it's a president or the king who protect his nation. So they are the shields of the earth. So all principalities, and powers will be subject unto God because he is greatly exalted. The rulers of the earth who are as shield and protection to their people, the Lord at his pleasure will set these, the princes of the people up and put them down. So God will put them up and down and their hearts in, in his hands. The shields of the earth belong to God. God can remove a king and can replace him with another. They belong to God. The heart of the king is in the hand of God. He is greatly exalted. When Jesus Christ came into the world, he broke down the wall of separation between the Gentiles and the Jews. Enabling all who trust in him, all who believe in him as Lord and Savior, to know assuredly that we are God's people. God of Abraham is our God. 
the one who shields, now that is our shield, who shield and protect us from any evils that might try to separate us from his love and care. Therefore, his people rejoice in God and highly exalt him. Let's conclude Psalm 47 from Psalms of David. Glory be to God forever and ever. Amen.